Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module. This is one of the VITS RHI catch-up sessions. Uh, the first two parts of this particular session was um, cases to do with abdominal opportunistic infections. This third case is going to be focusing on integrated metabolic disease um, with HIV and TB. So let's start with um, Mrs. MK who is a 53-year-old lady and has been attending your clinic since 2008. She started on ART in 2009 on AZT, 3TC, Afarin, so one of those older regimens, and her baseline CD4 count at that stage was 190. In 2010, she was diagnosed with hypertension, and she's now on hydrochlorothiazide, 12.5 milligrams per day. She's on Perendibrol, 4 milligrams per day, and Adelat XL, 30 milligrams daily. In 2012, she was found to have biological failure based on repeated elevated viral loads, and she was switched to Regimen 2. And remember, because she was an AZT at that point, they switched her to Tenofovir, 3TC, uh, and Alluvia. So firstly, the nurse has noted that she has a weight of 92 kilograms and with a BMI of 36, um, which would classify her as obese. Notice that the waist circumference was not done as it's not relevant in people who have a BMI over 30. In a patient with a BMI under 30, a waist circumference might add to the picture as well. The blood pressure there is 152 over 96. Her viral load was 4,255. Remember, she's already on second line. And up to now, her viral loads have been undetectable. The fasting glucose, 3.2. And we also have the results of a fasting lipogram that had been done with a total cholesterol of 8.23, which is very high, triglycerides 3.24, also high, an HDL of 1.04, which is low, and an LDL of 3.92, also high. And the creatinine clearance is 62 milliliters per minute, which is fortunately normal. So let's look a little bit at making a problem list of all the issues we want to look at with Mrs. MK. Um, and the reason why this is quite important is sometimes if one sees an abnormal result, one can get fixed on that one uh, result that jumps out at you. So if you're an HIV clinician, you might go, oh, it's the viral load. Um, if you are a family physician, you might be very concerned to see that cholesterol of 8.23. But we have to put um, specifically the BMI down as a concern as that is a high risk factor in its own right. The increased viral load, obviously of concern. The fact that her blood pressure is not controlled and she's already on three different treatments for that. Um, and she has this very dramatic dyslipidemia. So a high LDL, um, a high total cholesterol and high triglycerides. And I've got the formula in there for the LDL um, if that is not automatically done by the NHLS for you. Um, but most results we get will, will also give you the LDL result. The question we now need to ask ourselves is what her cardiovascular risk profile is. What is the risk of this lady having a heart attack or a stroke? And the reason why cardiovascular risk profiles was invented is they actually trying to ask, tell us about intervention. Um, and the million dollar question here is, do we need to give this lady a statin? It's not an automatic that everybody with a high cholesterol are necessarily going to benefit from using lipid-lowering drugs. Um, and the risk profile is supposed to assist us with that. So if somebody is quite young, got a low blood pressure, is not diabetic, is not smoking, is otherwise well, um, and they have increased cholesterol, they may very well not need tablets. And you can focus on, on lifestyle um, interventions. To determine a cardiovascular risk profile, you need to use a tool, and this is very controversial ground. Um, I'm not going to cover much of the background on this. The original formulas, the Framingham formula, for example, that's used in the UK, um, was trialed on very different uh, population than the one we have in South Africa. We do have an adapted um, tool that is can be found in the EML, and that's a tool I'll be using today, mostly for illustration purposes. Although these tools certainly have um, questions regarding validity, it is certainly better to have some sort of conversation with your patient around risk, and I find the tool is a very good way to do that. So let's just look at how the tool works. You're basically going to 
for this patient in terms of their risk. And you're going to look at several factors. So the first we're going to look at is the age. So our lady is 53. And you can see that in a 53-year-old woman, that scores is seven points. And it's interesting to note that once you are over 35 years old, you're starting to increase your risk. Total cholesterol of 8.23, and you can see there the, um, that gives her an additional five points. Her HDL cholesterol is low. If your HDL cholesterol is high, it will actually uh, reduce your risk, but unfortunately, she gets an additional point for that low HDL cholesterol. For interest's sake, to be able to increase your HDL cholesterol, the best way to do that is exercise, um, and is a practical way of showing your patient on how they can reduce their risk. The patient is fortunately not smoking and is not a diabetic. That dramatically increases your risk. Um, and she's a hypertensive already on treatment. And you look at the systolic blood pressure there of 152, um, and you can see that gives her another six points. So what do you do now do with this, this score? And there's a second table that you will then look at to determine her particular risk. Um, and what we want to know is what is her 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease. And we define that by saying, what is the chances that in the next 10 years, she's going to either have um, a myocardial infarct or a stroke? And you can see there she's scoring 19, um, which gives her a total risk of 24.8%. So she has a 24.8% risk of having a stroke or an MI in the next 10 years. Um, and in medical terms, we consider that a high risk patient, that might be quite reassuring because it means there's a 75% chance that she's going to be fine. Um, but if you look at so many of our patients, if you have 100 patients all with this kind of a profile, it means 25 of them is going to have an event within the next 10 years. Before we look at what we're going to do with that result, let's just think a little bit about what's might, what might be compounding this cardiovascular um, risk picture that we are seeing. And unfortunately, HIV infection on its own, also increases your cardiovascular risk. Um, then the ARV drugs that we are using certainly helps reduce the risk of the HIV infection itself, but the actual drugs can also be problematic. So, for example, your PIs can especially have an effect on your triglycerides. The old NRTIs, such as D40 or AZT, has been shown independently to increase your risk and to have a negative effect on your lipid profile. Um, and there has been concerns about a back of her, especially in your elderly patients, also increasing the risk of MI. Um, we're not sure about that data within our population in South Africa. Of course, her blood pressure not being properly controlled is going to be massively impacting on that. Her, uh, the fact that she's overweight might be what's partly leading to her um, high risk factors. And they might also just be genetic constitutional factors that's also contributing. So now we need to ask ourselves the questions on how we're going to manage this elevated cholesterol level. And you'll notice that I'm first addressing her cardiovascular risk. I'm not yet addressing her viral load. Her risk for a higher mortality as well as morbidity is much more linked to these cardiovascular factors than actually her HIV. Um, and of course, the most important thing we need to help her address is her lifestyle. Although it's the most important and the most significant, it is the most difficult to get people to change what they do is very hard. And I think that's why there's such a tendency to go for a medical intervention, because it seems so much simpler. Um, probably the most important thing we want to do with her lifestyle is to look at her exercise levels and to look at the quality of the food that she's eating. And I'm not going to cover those in detail in this presentation. Um, I think there's quite a lot written about those, those factors. But as doctors, we have to actively address risk factors such as her um, hypertension. We need to, obviously, if there was factors such as diabetes or smoking, they would have had to have been addressed. And the obesity needs to be addressed as a medical condition. Um, in South Africa, in the public sector, we don't actually have medical options for that. We, we still back at our lifestyle advice. For example, in the NICE guidelines within the UK, you might very well start looking at medical interventions to also help them reduce her weight. Um, and then the, the third question is obviously, can we bring that cholesterol down with medication? If you look at her risk um, factors uh, in our EML, if somebody has a risk of greater than 20% in the next 10 years, then they actually qualify for a lipid lowering agent. And in the public sector, that always means statin. 
So in this outpatient, it's qualifying for a, a lipid-lowering agent. And now the question is, what are we going to choose? She's already on ARVs as well as other, um, other treatment for her hypertension. In most patients on first-line treatment, we would still normally choose a statin. The problem is you cannot use simvastatin with a PI. So this lady's on second line. She's already on lupinavir, ritonavir, um, and we therefore has to use, use drugs such as atorvastatin or more ideally pravastatin. The challenge is you're not going to have pravastatin available in your normal clinic or even in many of our district hospitals. And they quite often have to be referred to regional or tertiary hospitals, which is challenging. If the patient's on a PI, you're probably going to consider changing that PI first. So she's on lupinavir, ritonavir, and in this patient, we might first try to actually change that um, to atazanavir, ritonavir, and see how much that has an impact on that lipid profile um, due to the complications of using a statin. As both the triglyceride and the LDL cholesterol is up, it's actually good practice to, to use a fibrate, such as phenofibrate, and then use a statin later. One can also use fish oils or niacin, but none of these are available in the public sector. So your best option is probably going to be to change to a, 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 a tazanavir, see what happens, um, and if you're still having troubles to address that um, high cholesterol and triglycerides, you may have to refer to a tertiary or regional hospital for best practice treatment. A very important part of being able to monitor how it is going with the treatment, but also very important for your patient, is setting very clear treatment goals. There's not much point in making all these interventions and not actually knowing whether they're having any impact. Firstly, we want to set a goal for that LDL cholesterol, um, which is sort of the bugbear in cardiovascular management at the moment. And you want to try and get that cholesterol at least under 3 millimoles per litre. In high-risk patients, there is even recommendations of setting that goal even lower. So, for example, the SMA, SAMJ's article, Cardiovascular Risk Assessment, sets a goal of less than 2.5 in high-risk patients, um, and if the risk is over 30%, as low as 1.8. Blood pressure, normally we have a goal of getting it under 140 over 90, um, but there's more and more evidence that in our high-risk patients, and for example, our diabetic patients, we want to get that blood pressure even lower. Uh, weight one has to be realistic. Um, setting a, a goal of a normal weight or a normal BMI is, is not always practical. Um, and actually, it's been shown that most of your benefit already comes from that first 10% of body weight that you lose. I think partly because of the, the lifestyle changes you have to make to, to lose that 10%. So it might be prudent to at first just set a goal um, of that less than 10%. And then, of course, we want to get that viral load. LDL is that will also reduce her risk. We have to speak about the viral load. I'm not going to cover this in this presentation in detail. We have lots of other modules, particularly speaking about a raised viral load. Just to remind us of something called the ABCD. For those of you that's not seen the presentation, it means that any patient with a high viral load, we're going to check A, adherence. We're going to check B, bugs, if there are any other opportunistic infections, such as TB and STIs, for example. C stands for correct dose. Is this patient on the correct treatment and the correct dose? And D stands for drug interactions. Are they taking any other medications that's interfering? You would write down all of these factors that you have looked at and that you've addressed with your patient, and you will repeat your viral load in two months' time to see whether that viral load has suppressed properly. More importantly, we have to look at these risk factors. So we've spoke, spoken about a statin, um, but we have to look at this blood pressure. And anybody, by the time they're on two or three tablets and they are not having um, good control, your biggest question is going to be adherence. Don't just keep on adding tablets unless you're sure they're actually taking and tolerating the tablets that they're on. Um, and lifestyle is still very important, speaking particularly around diet and particularly around salt intake. The current medication um, is there. I think in the current EML, most patients are not on perendopril. They might be on enalapril, 10 milligrams BD. Um, and your first port of call will probably be to address that um, ACE inhibitor by doubling the dose. Um, your next port of call might be to double the dose of your hydrochlorothiazide. Uh, but first, go back to your adherence. 
Would you change her ARVs at this point? Most definitely not from a failure, viral load failure point of view. First, try and get things um, under control. Um, but we have spoken about the fact that the PIs might be contributing to that increase of cholesterol and triglycerides. And it might be worthwhile to first start switching that lupinavir to atazanavir. Um, in this case, I'll probably try the lifestyle changes first, get that viral load suppressed before considering the switch. And lastly, and probably my most important point is when you, this patient is going to need to be accompanied on a whole journey of addressing all of these factors. I mean, the matter of fact, the viral load is, the, is going to be the least difficult thing to address. Um, and therefore, it's quite useful to bring them back always to the same clinician and that that one clinician is looking at the whole picture. So looking at both the viral load, looking at the hypertension, looking at the weight issues, looking at the cholesterol um, to ensure you have an integrated approach and that we are actually going to help this lady change the factors that might lead to, um, to the risk of stroke or heart attack. Thank you very much. Please do see the first two modules in this case series that focuses particularly on gastrointestinal and abdominal cases um, to be able to complete the session. Thank you.